coming up on Theater Talk. Please. Charles, do you, do you ever, does your heart ever sink when you think, oh my God, I have to see another Hamlet again? Well, Mine I does. mean, yeah. <laughs> Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. So, Michael, we've reached the midpoint of the Broadway and off-Broadway season. Yes, we've had a very, very busy fall on Broadway, and we are going to go through some of the hits and misses. <laughs> With our panel of experts, we are joined tonight by Elizabeth Vincentelli, my friend and colleague from the New York Post. Welcome hey, to Theater look. Talk. Uh, Charles Isherwood from the New York Times. Welcome to Theater Talk, Charles. Thank you. And Jesse Green, who used to be a pundit for us for many years. Well, but, he still uh, is. Yes, but now he's a, th he's a proper he's theater both, critic yes. at New York Magazine, just at the time when the magazine is kind of unraveling, isn't it, Jesse? Uh, how so? <laughs> well, didn't you just announce that it's, uh, it's becoming a monthly or a quarterly or something like that? I think we're publishing every decade, once every a decade. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm still going to be in it every week. I don't care how often it comes out. <laughs> <laughs> You're still going to write every week, right? Um, all right, guys, I want to start with um, the critic-proof event, really. Not even a play, an event of the fall season, which was Betrayal with uh, Daniel Craig and Rachel Weiss and what was the name, Timothy Spall. Rafe Spall. Rafe Spall, Rafe. right, yeah. Um, what do you mean not a play? Well, it's not. Last I checked, Betrayal was actually a play well, written well, by a real playwright. Hold on, though, Jesse, but don't you feel that it's produced by Scott Rudin, but don't you feel he made it more of event theater than an actual play? And did you like this production? Isn't it just, you know, come see stars and pay $500 to see them, and your opinion as critics is immaterial because the show was sold oh, out well, before you got there. Our opinion is immaterial, I'll get, absolutely. On everything. But, uh, yes, <laughs> I was going to say, but not just on event right. plays. Right, right. Um, but just because it's an event doesn't mean it isn't also a play with things to admire and th things to admire less. Well, what did, did you not like about it? Seems you've got some reservations. I, I, I thought it was uh, somewhat becalmed. Hmm. I guess I would say, although I thought that Rafe Spall was excellent. Hmm. Elizabeth, your opinion on Daniel Craig and Rachel Weisz? Were they the sexiest couple on Broadway this past season? Uh, no, but then at the same time, uh, I am not the biggest Pinter fan. I think he's incredibly overrated. Um, just the whole Pinter pause, it's just like it means nothing. It really means nothing. It's just, <laughs> it's become shorthand for, I have no idea what's going on, but it sounds really cool and dangerous slightly. <laughs> I don't really know what's going on. It, it's just incredibly overrated. But that said, uh, this particular production was kind of like a low boil. But again, Mike Nichols, also incredibly overrated. So you have like a kind of supernova conflagration of... <laughs> overratedness. Of or overratedness. <laughs> which, and then people are surprised. They're like, oh, it's, it's, you know, it didn't really do it for me. Why should you be surprised? It's like an incredibly <laughs> flat playwright and a completely overrated director. Boy, you're not you going to be Scott Rudin once this anytime soon. <laughs> I think that's a thumbs down. <laughs> I mean, it's fine for what it is, but don't expect something great because it's not going to be great. Right. Well, oh, Charles, now, Elizabeth, well, get off the fens. Charles, uh, uh, is, she, is she right about Pinterest? No, I think, it, I think it is actually quite a good play. Um, no Man's Land is another story. It's gimmicky. But this production, I, it's funny you called it Becalmed. I thought it was a little bit overwrought, actually, at times. I, I would want a few more meaningful pauses in that production. It seemed very much on the surface, uh, highly emotional in a way that I don't expect a pinner play to be in. For me, it's sort of pushing all the subtext onto the surface of a pinner play sort of, you know, destroys it. I, I, there, there, there were some scenes I thought it was like a Mike Nichols play being done up there. Yeah, like a oh, no, Neil Simon play. <laughs> oh, sorry, played. Neil Simon play, yeah. Directed by Mike Nichols, yeah. yeah, yeah. There was, I, didn't you find it a little sort of hokey, some of the, the, the pushing for the humor a little, little too much? No. God, you have no taste. I guess that's <laughs> the critic. That's right. Um, the first requirement. Do you guys even care, though, on the larger issue? Do you, with all these celebrities coming, and they've been in a lot of plays that uh, you guys have been sort of cool to, like Tom Hanks with Lucky Guy, um, certainly with this one. Do you, does it bother you at all that producers are actively trying to diminish your power? Elizabeth? I don't see it like that way at all. I mean, the, the thing is with a lot of stars, not all, but a lot of them, there's a reason they're stars. A lot of them have incredible charisma. And when they're in the room, you really feel it. And you can't buy that. You have it or you don't. It's really unfair that way. It's Julianne Moore, when she made her 
stage debut, she did not have it, but I think Tom Hanks had it. Mm -hmm. uh, and well, yes, it does make a difference. But you know, one, one instance where it didn't make a difference is you have Ethan Hawke in Macbeth. A star. He's of, never well, had any charisma. Well, all right, but well, what I'm saying that that, that yeah. the, the critics do matter there because they hated it so much. I don't know how well it's doing. Well, from what I hear, it's very easy to get seats. Let's put it. I mean, way. I I but, enjoyed it. it. It's fascinating production, but uh, from a certain perspective. But oh, it's I'm just saying all right. the critics can be make a difference. Well, did you like well, this production? Uh, uh, no, I gave it a pretty negative review. Right. I, I respected the. Uh, I thought it was visually fascinating. Right. A friend of mine said that wish they could see the. The Verdi Opera on that set, they'd have a very nice evening. But the, <laughs> the actual production that we saw didn't come up to the level of the of the design. Except John Lover was fantastic. Did you see it, Charles? Did you? No, no. I'm happy to hear it's <laughs> seats are available because I haven't yet gone. <laughs> the concept of the witches being women. I mean, John Glover's a wonderful actor, but you know, running around with those beanbag breasts of his, it well, was all very weird. Yes, it's it just also bugged me, actually. I have to say, but like, I think if guys could stop hogging all the roles on Broadway <laughs> this season. We have the all male, two all male Shakespeare's, and now we have men playing the witches. I mean, come on, like, do you have to play everything? Well, where like, was there anything left? Well, you had your all female Julius Caesar. Yeah. Oh, that where, was off Broadway. Was that? that was like one, one show off Broadway. You can't compare to, like, this. Hey, I go to Hooters, file. and that's all women. <laughs> all oh, the time. Is that something different? <laughs> when have you been to Hooters? Oh, sorry, that was completely Charles, false. I, I, we've had, we have had was a lot. Was that a BAM? <laughs> yeah, Hooters at BAM. It's Hooters at BAM. Part of the next, next I week. I can see Eva right. Van Hove doing it there. <laughs> I, I would be there in a second, you know. Yeah, I'm sure you There's would. subtitles and Hooters. I am going to be right. all over it. <laughs> Charles, we've, we've had a lot of Shakespeare, maybe too much Shakespeare uh, recently. Um, and as Elizabeth said, we had the all-male productions of Richard III and Twelfth Night with Mark Rylance and Stephen Fry. Um, did these work for you, uh, these, these Richard III? And oh, very much. I think it was really one of the highlights of the entire year. Mm -hmm. um, Mark Rylance is such a phenomenal actor. The At this point, what more do we say about him? He's so versatile and amazing. Um, and I like the, you know, the original practices uh, gimmick with the candles dripping onto the stage. Yes. I actually liked the Richard III, which many people didn't. I thought they played it as a sort of rollicking black comedy. Yeah, it plays, um, more, it plays more like a comedy than And it was, it was great fun, and Twelfth Night was, you know, Twelfth Night is a play that we've seen so many times that it's sort of like, I re am I really gonna endure this one more time? <laughs> but uh, once again, I thought it was a pretty charming production. I actually found that the rollickingness of the Richard III, uh, Richard III exposed some of the faults of the play so severely that I, I didn't enjoy it for that reason. Whereas in the Twelfth Night, I felt the uh, the original practices, the kind of falseness, the kind of uh, artifice of all that, made it much more emotional for me. So mm. the comedy was more emotional and the tragedy was more ridiculous. Now I know Elizabeth uh, from talking to you at the office. You've you've sort of headed up to here with Shakespeare. Are you are you Shakespeared out and and why? Well, this season, yes. I mean, this season has been a kind of perfect storm of <laughs> Shakespeareness, <laughs> because in addition to the one we've mentioned, there was also a Midsummer Night's Dream at uh, Julie Tamor. Julie Tamor, your, your, your old friend. Or come back after Spider Man. Come back after the uh, warmish your warmish uh, campaign. <laughs> Uh, and uh, there was the Julius Caesar. There's been like, just a ton, and we have more. Two Romeo and Juliet's, so let's not forget. Of course, that. two <laughs> Romeo and Juliet's. I mean, it's been just really. And I. So, on the one hand, there's been some really good productions in that lot, and several that I've liked a lot. But it just feels that we're not seeing any other classic plays, and other classic playwrights are really falling by the wayside because all we see now is like. Classic equals Shakespeare, and it's really, really frustrating. That's a good point, really. though, Charles. Do you, do you ever, does your heart ever sink when you think, oh my God, I have to see another Hamlet again? Well, Mine I does. mean, yeah, something. <laughs> but, you know, a good Shakespeare production, or a great one, is going to totally, you know, recharge your batteries. Um, and like it's, I think it's a coincidence. Yeah. I don't think that, you know, no, it's yeah, going to be Shakespeare from here on out. Um, and, you know, you see, Revivals of Webster plays or Thomas Kidd and you know, but rarely though. I would love very to see, rarely. I would love to see something like The White Devil, which I think is a wonderful play that no, no one does. Those where do they I do? I saw these it plays? in London years ago. It wasn't so great. It was not Shakespeare. Let's put it that. I missed. Well, now what did you all think of of Julie Taymor's Midsummer Night's Dream? I thought it was uh, respectable, visually beautiful. I mean, some of her tricks are by now familiar, of course, but uh, I, you know, it's not a. Midsummer Night's Dream that anyone is going to remember for the phenomenal acting, I don't think. I thought when the spider came down from the, from the <laughs> fly, that 
that was just incredible. Well, you know, very self-referential. <laughs> well, you know, I, 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 I'm a great admirer of Julie's, despite our bashing of Spider-Man relentlessly. But the one thing I think you can fault her on is she, she really doesn't deal with actors. She no, it stylized was, it was a kind of wooden. Yes, production. I know. There were some really good performances in that play. There were some really bad ones, like really, really bad. I think the the gap between the good performances and yeah. the bad ones was kind of stunning, actually. Mm. Uh, it, it runs such a, I mean, it's rare to see a production with the range between the really good performances, and I would mention Who Catherine did you Hunter. like? Yeah. Oh, Catherine Hunter, I Very thought good. was absolutely fantastic. As Puck. It was a great year for her. She was also in Kafka's Monkey. I mean, it's mm -hmm. just, she's absolutely but you, incredible. You, a very mannered Puck. Then the Very young cool. lovers were so appallingly bad <laughs> that, including one, including one of them who I think is the son of the artistic director at, oops. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so they were just. Uh, I'm they sure were that's just the first time nepotism has <laughs> reared ugly head in the theater. I know, I know. It's just Jesse, unthinkable. You, you're, you're, you're very close to Julie. You've profiled her a lot. You know her. <laughs> you mean work. because she hasn't sued me? <laughs> <laughs> that qualifies. But if that qualifies, then but, yes. But you, you've seen her work. I mean, yes. you know her well. It, it, she doesn't real. Does she really deal with actors? Does no, she know how no, to, no. I often say that she gets better performances out of masks than she gets out of people, <laughs> uh, and the people end up being wooden. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, as Elizabeth said, if you hire the right actors, that doesn't matter because right. they know what to do. And uh, I would also point to Tina Benko. Tina Benko is yes. Um, but uh, if you're going to hire very young kids who are really still in school and not give them any direction as to how to perform, it's really not their fault if they I, don't show up well compared to I the others. I was actually frustrated because the uh, off-Broadway Romeo and Juliet, I was, I was really looking forward to seeing Elizabeth Olsen in that. And I think she's, a, she's a, young, a young actress who's doing Romeo and Juliet and unfortunately was working with the director who had no idea what she was doing. The director, I mean, was, mm -hmm. didn't know what she was doing. And I felt like there was a good Juliet lurking somewhere in there, but she didn't have anybody to tell her and she doesn't have, and Elizabeth Sultan doesn't have the experience to figure it out on her own like Tina Benko would. Yes. She's very young and, and I really wish that this experience, I mean that show was trashed by everybody deservedly, it was terrible, but I really wish this is not going to turn, turn Elizabeth Sultan off the theater because I would love to see her again. I think she has a great presence and again that's what you can't buy and she has it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she and sure does. someone needs to get it out of her but well, they they're not going to get it out of somebody in six weeks. This is part of the problem. Well, yeah. A lot of the greats yeah. who became great and don't need assistance from directors anymore did so because when they were right. coming up, they would work for months on something, or they'd mm -hmm. be in a repertory company, or you know. Right. Well, speak, speaking of which, two <laughs> two greats who did come up that way, who worked in rep companies, who worked with great actors, uh, Ian McKellen and Patrick Stewart Charles, uh, also in rep now on Broadway in um, No Man's Land and Waiting for Godot. Um, or Gado, as they say. Yeah, how, 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 <laughs> what is the pronunciation? The British say Gado. And what do you say? It's British. Uh, I get confused now. <laughs> well, <laughs> it as comes as out I, every which way. As as Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Yes, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's how do you say it version. en français, Elizabeth? Godou. Good, yeah. Godou. 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 <laughs> Godou. <laughs> so, I say, so what did you think of waiting for Godou, Charles? <laughs> uh, I'm not even going to attempt that pronunciation. <laughs> um, I thought this was disappointing mm, because, really? uh, you know, they're both very fine actors, but I, it was a very shticky, big, let's play to the uh, comedy approach to the play. Um, I'm beginning to think that I don't ever want to see that play in a Broadway house. I think it does not really uh, lend itself to that kind of atmosphere. Um, I, would, I would agree with that. That said, you know, Ian McKellen is brilliant, you know, in particular, and The No Man's Land, he was also brilliant. That, I have to agree, was one of those less to this than meets the eye, Pinner's play or ear, Pinner plays. Um, really? Why, why do you say that? Because I always thought No Man's Land was sort of an underappreciated Pinter play, but you think... Have you seen it lately? No. <laughs> <laughs> Who was it who told us I mean, that he it thought... Has one, well, it, you know, the premiere with Ralph Richardson and... Is legendary. You, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I think that the mystique surrounding that probably has something to do with it. This is the first time I'd seen it, and uh, I was sort of with it for a while, and then eventually, you know, I sort of flatlined and 
Right. Someone who was on this show said that they thought that Pinter was drunk when he wrote it, and I, I think we, it was I, Ian, McC I Ian McKellen that, yes. and Patrick Stewart. They said that he, it said it's about drunks, and, and well, it seems like Pinter was drunk when he. And was to writing. me, it, that was a liability. If to If you were script. going to eliminate all the plays that were written by <laughs> drunk playwrights <laughs> from the canon, there would be none left. No, not <laughs> written by drunk playwrights. Written while the playwright was drunk. Even then. Yeah. Even right. then. <laughs> all of Tennessee Williams gone. Oh, gone. All, yeah. of Stephen so all of Stephen Sondheim, another I'm one. No, no, that's not making air. No, no, no. He has. Said he said, what you, would you stop he defending Steve, your God, Stephen Sondheim? He has said in that that seven thousand page New York Frank Rich New York magazine that he was drunk he, while he wrote he, it. He drinks while he writes. He's oh, like, it is this. never written a single song while not. I don't know, drunk, I but... I think he's sipping whiskey. Let's not say... Without <laughs> drinking. Yes, Without all right, drinking. all right. I stand. But where right. were we? Well, uh, uh... I don't know. Shakespeare. We were talking <laughs> about... <laughs> we were oh, talking about... No Man's Sondheim Land. Gods. We were, we were no on to the other bloated... <laughs> you, you don't like... Did you not like No Man's Land? I did like No Man's Land. I did too, actually. Uh, and uh, I, I, I can understand Charles's opinion. It just wasn't the way it struck me. And I also thought the opportunity to... The opportunity? To, <laughs> the opportunity to see McKellen do... Those two contrasting roles, his superb carriage uh, and, and m radically different way of holding, everything about watching him on stage is a joy and a lesson. Does he overshadow uh, Patrick Stewart in these plays, Elizabeth? I, I think McKellen? so, yeah. He does. Well, because Patrick Stewart ends up pay playing the straight man, so to speak, in both shows, so it's a little... It's hard not to be overshadowed, but I mean... Yeah. It's a little the bit plays of a were in a way overshadowed, too, but uh, mm -hmm. who cares? By him, yeah. Although Billy Crudup was, I thought, uh, pretty great. Mm. Um, could we talk about a show that Charles quite liked, A Gentleman's Guide to Love and Murder? Mm. Yes, I think it's an absolute. Stop seething, dear. <laughs> <laughs> is, Your turn is, will come. This is based um, on this is based on the same source material as Kind Heart and Coronet. Yes, which uh, is a movie I've always watched. And uh, Jefferson Mays plays how many characters? He plays, plays Alec Guinness. He plays yeah. He plays eight, mm -hmm. I think. All all but one doomed. I think it's a really charming show. It sort of brings back the operetta, which is, you know, something you're not going to have coming around anytime soon again, I think. And I thought it was just delightfully funny. His performance is very, you know, it's one of those true tour de forces, tour de forces where, you know, he's off stage for 30 seconds and comes on as another character. I had a great time. <laughs> gather Elizabeth did not sorry but you, I was dozing just hearing about it <laughs> <laughs> all right Elizabeth put the knife in um I actually I love operetta it's really one of my favorite musical genres and I was really looking forward to to this particular show also liking the source story I haven't read the book but I also like the movie uh that was also pulled from the book but I was so bored I was so bored because the problem, I think the, there's a huge structural problem with the show. Gentlemen, guys, to love and murder. Murder takes up the entire first act. Most of the murders take place in the entire, and then the love is in the second act. And you have a completely, a very, the, the balance is out of whack in that show. Because Jefferson Mays is pretty much dies seven times in the first act, and it goes very fast. And it becomes so sticky and tiresome that you just keep waiting for him to run across the stage again, sweating, and, and you start wondering about the costume people working the little, you know, like... You really are making bees. it sound boring, Elizabeth. Stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, uh, I, I think show it's over I, 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 I think was, people I, should see the show. I mean, you know, it's if it's you're an Anglophile a, like me, I think Oh, it's well, there you go. Okay, that's it. <laughs> Jesse, would you like to... It's like very to easy for me you? to thread that needle. I mean, <laughs> yes. there's quite a lot of space in between. <laughs> yes. Those, sure. uh, for me, I, I was Can you give us a more measured opinion? I thought it was a lot of fun. I felt it was a little twee. Uh, which is its raison d'etre, but but a little of that goes a Jefferson long way. Jefferson Mays, a little, little of Jefferson Mays goes a long way, as far as I'm concerned. A, a, a little English, Englishness goes a long way. But I I, I think <laughs> it's Not, the kind of show I would like to encourage. Uh, sorry, Elizabeth. I, I I want people who are interested in trying new ways of telling stories or old ways of telling but, stories to have a place on Broadway. And I think it's fun enough that people should give it a I shot. I do second that. I like the idea of the show, and I like that it's there. It's one of those shows that I'm happy they're around. I just don't want to have to see it ever again. <laughs> well, I will also say that compared to many new musicals that we see, at least it had, you know, some lovely Ambition. little ditties and melodies in it, as opposed to, can we move on to Fun Home? Caption. My dad and I...
both grew up in the same small Pennsylvania town. And he was gay, and I was gay, and he killed himself. And I became a lesbian cartoonist. Fun Home was praised to the skies by your colleague, well, Ben Bradley, most right? critics were over the moon. Right, but you... I, you, I wasn't. Well, you, oh, you, really? you oh. find it over, you I find was. Fun Home overrated. Well, wait a minute, you can jump in and toot the horn for Fun Home, but Charles killed well, it. Well, you can start by tooting the horn. I no, mean, no, no, I, no, 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 I'm not. Tear I'm, it down. I didn't think it was a... Michael, really. I did not <laughs> think it was by any means a bad musical. I thought it was a nice little off-Broadway mm -hmm. sort of chamber piece. Um, I didn't think the storytelling was very good. You, you complain about the structure of uh, John's no, I, Guide. I agree. Although it's based this on a wonderful graphic novel. Yes. I indeed. could not finish it. <laughs> oh, you could graphic novel. Oh, I quite like it. Well. Just, oh. What's it about? Uh, well, it's about, well, it's sort of twin stories. A young woman who, you know, discovers she's a lesbian. It's her coming out story contrasted with her father's sort of closing down story. And he's um, coming out not well, to give anything away. No, but... Uh, uh, he, told he's in the gay. first scene that, yeah. that yeah. the father yeah. Yeah. is gay also, uh, although it has been in the closet all her yeah. childhood. And the uh, ironies of the two movements crossing each other, her becoming an adult and accepting herself and his basically not, and I won't say what happened right, at the end, right. is the engine of the story. Yeah. And you liked it. I liked it a great deal. And, it, and it, it's interesting you talked about uh, Gentleman's Guide and the ditties and the nice music compared to Fun Home, which has a score by Janine Tesori, who's, uh, you know, I don't know if, if she's your taste in general or not. I've always liked her music. It's not pretty, exactly. It's, that's not what the function of music is in that show. But in a show like Gentleman's Guide, where being an operetta, the music has to carry a lot. I would like to have seen something a little more full-bodied and l greater than a ditty. More, uh, well, I don't think they were only ditties, but um, I, like I would ditties. like, I, I would like, ditties. you know, I would just wanted stronger music from Fun Home. I mean, I think some, but when the best songs in the show are pastiche versions of yes. Partridge Family and, you know, <laughs> Jackson oh 5 songs. That was, true. that was quite fabulous. I mean, there's some beautiful, you know, interstitial music. Mm -hmm. um, Yuck. But I didn't really think that the, and also I had a problem with the structure. It's a very diffuse show. What did you no, think? No, I, I agree of? actually. I, I liked it, but I didn't love it. I, uh, there's too much cuteness with the, with the kids. Uh, it leans very heavily on, on cuteness. It's, it's really interesting for a show that aims to be a serious show. It realize, uh, I have a problem with, there were too many kids on stage this fall. So, <laughs> so Shakespeare, Shakespeare Sansa, 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 and, and children. Yeah. I would say the best musical, Charles, that I've seen all season is After Midnight, which is the Duke Ellington review. It's not a book musical, but the songs are great, fantastic dancing. It's very elegantly staged and produced. Uh, uh, you seem to enjoy it. Oh, I loved it. And I think what, the one thing you didn't mention is the music. I mean, the musicianship. Oh, uh, yeah. Wynton Marsalis's uh, jazz is band. completely phenomenal. I was, you know, enthralled just listening. I could have just watched the band play for two hours. Yeah, I, I remember I, I did detect in your review, you thought, okay, the dancing's good, but I'd rather just hear the band. Well, well with all this tap well, stuff. When that, when the bandstand moved downstage mm -hmm. toward the audience, you just sort of, it, it was like this ocean wave of joy coming off the stage. It was a wonderful moment and expressive of what's great about that show. Yeah, yeah. and you enjoyed it too? Oh, I loved it, loved it. It's a great show. Yeah, and also, I, I like musicals. I like the Burt Bacharach musical as well, um, What's It All About? More and more, I'm coming to like musicals that don't have a story, that are just well, good it avoids songs. a problem, well, doesn't it? I, it's right. <laughs> there's You're no second act problem when exactly. there's no story. You're not going to have book problems with a <laughs> bookless musical. But but they're not as easy as you might think, or we'd have seen more successful reviews. And and uh, what's it all about? Uh, really, is extremely smart beneath the apparent ease of the sing just song after song. There's actually something going on that holds it together quite beautifully. Yeah, well, uh, did you like What's It All About, Elizabeth? Mm, not really. Why not? I just don't see the point of it. Shakespeare, Backrack. No, no, actually, <laughs> I love Backrack. That is, he's one of my But what I like so much about this guys. is that, you know, it's young kids who are reinterpreting these songs and making them contemporary, and so you're Making them, them contemporary how? Like how? Just because you had a guitar solo that is preposterous. No, these songs are completely Backrack songs do not, no, no, no. <laughs> They're just, it's, it's, it's a joke. <laughs> okay. Everything's joke. black and white with you. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. I think uh, it's good to be opinionated and uh, we'll shop it outside with 
you know, my <laughs> gloves, sir. The, the whole hoot nanny busker vibe drove me crazy, but I didn't feel they were trying to be hip. <laughs> We got I mean, a, we got afterward. A, we got no. We're at we're, the, who you can't you can't improve on hootenanny and the way you pronounce it hootenanny. I know it's <laughs> waiting for so a gudu. <laughs> hootenanny. And, gudu at the hootenanny. All right, Jesse Green, who's but you're you're awfully easygoing critic these days. You seem to like everything. No, I I, I keep an average and make sure it's well below two stars. <laughs> Jesse Green from New York Magazine, Charles Isherwood from the New York Times. And Elizabeth Black and White Janelli <laughs> from me. I'm just like a black and New York cookie. <laughs> <laughs> that should be the name That's of your supporting. memoirs. New what York did you cookie. call New York what? The New York cookie. The black and white cookie. I can't understand a thing you're saying. <laughs> cookie. <laughs> I don't know. It's all coming out today. translate next time. Thanks a lot. titles. That's right. Thanks for being our guest on Theater Talk. <laughs>